I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 is going to be our passage for today. Uh, it's a celebration. It's a time of a wedding. Ah, don't you guys love weddings? How many of you guys love weddings? The partying, the dancing, the celebration. It's awesome. Love weddings. Today we're going to be looking at a wedding in Scripture. You know, sometimes I, I think to myself, you know, uh, before we get into the message, uh, so I was considering this passage, I was considering the first miracle of Jesus, the fact that, you know, that he went to a wedding. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at my time and I think it's so limited, right? I think to myself, man, we have such limited time. I want to make the best time uh, for God. I want to do everything. I want to I use my time to the fullest to, to serve God. But sometimes you just look at Jesus and he was just walking places. He was just hanging out. Jesus was taking life easy. Jesus, like, if you were to think, what's the first thing Jesus did in his ministry? You wouldn't think, ah, oh, he went to a party, right? And it was just, it's just a, a beautiful reminder this week as I, as I took the week off, as I took a time of rest, took a time of, of just recovery, uh, just to enjoy life, you know? We're, we're at a place of victory, like Gabriel was saying. We're, we're at a place where we celebrate, right? Like we don't have to toil and work towards our salvation. It is already a gift from God. And so let us enjoy it, and let's live life for God in every moment that we're given. So it's just a reminder for me this weekend. I hope you're there by now. John chapter 2, we're going to read uh, starting in verse 1, and we're going to go all the way through verse 11. In honor of God's word, I'm going to invite you to stand, please. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It says this, The third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, What business do you have with me, woman? Ooh, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots standing there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing two or three measures each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. Now, when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the guests are drunk, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. God, we ask you for your word today to be effective into our lives. God, help us to understand it to be able to apply it into our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of today's message is From Water to Wine, The Transformative Power of Jesus. From Water to Wine, The Transformative Power of Jesus. How many of you guys are familiar with this passage? You've heard, you've heard it before. Okay, we're familiar with this passage, but sometimes familiarity kind of breeds uh, comfort, comfortability. And because we're so familiar with the story, sometimes we fail to see some of the, the, uh, the truths that are in a passage like this one. And what we see throughout this passage is one big thing, Jesus transforming water to wine. That's the obvious. That's the thing that's put right in front of your face. And that is an important fact. That is a big point of what we're going to be looking at today. But it's not the only thing that transforms throughout this passage. We're going to be looking at the transformative power of Jesus, not just to do uh, things like physical things like turning water into wine, but the fact that Jesus has the power to not only transform things, but to be able to transform our lives. Now, here's what I'll tell you about transforming lives. I think in our culture, in our society, we have this desire for transformation. I don't know if you ever get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you think to yourself, something has to change, right? I mean, sometimes we, we look at ourselves and, and we're like, there has to be a moment 
of transformation. We're fascinated by stories of transformation, right? Like how many of you guys have ever seen that show, My, My 400-Pound Life, or I don't, I don't even know what it's called. Like these are people who are, are there's, like that one, there's many other shows, right? Like uh, What's the Biggest Loser and all of these different things. We are fascinated with this idea of people transforming who they are by looking at themselves and not being comfortable with who they are and being transformed into something new. Unfortunately, though, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the statistics to those shows and, and things like that, but those who are the biggest losers are also often the biggest gainers. Uh, after a time of, uh, of, of, of losing the weight, they tend to rebound. It's a rebound effect in your diet, and you go probably to the same weight that you were, if not more. How many of you guys have experienced the rebound effect? Amen. Yes, all the time. All right? It's maintenance phase. You need a maintenance phase. That's what's needed. But anyways, uh, I, won't get you, I won't give you diet advice. I'm not a dietitian. All right? And so, and so there's a transformative power. There's this thing that we desire for transformation. But it's not just physical. You know, sometimes in the beginning of the year, we, we do try to look our best. We try to go to a workout, go to the gym, things like that. But sometimes we feel like we need a transformation in, in some other areas of our lives. Maybe you're just tired of being broke. You're just tired of not having enough money. You're just tired of living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And no matter how much money you make, you end up having that much debt. And it's funny because in the United States, you would assume that those with the highest amounts of income have the lowest amount of debt, but there are people who have massive amounts of income, and yet they incur massive amounts of debt. And they can't change and they can't transform until they finally uh, uh, run into Dave Ramsey and they realize that they have to change. And Dave Ramsey tells them how they stop spending on the credit card. And, and that's a motivator. And they change and they finally get their stuff together. And they're able to now have a healthy financial life. And unfortunately, sometimes people will fall back into those old patterns once they get above water and they'll get back into debt. And so they have to do Financial Peace University again and all that stuff. You know, sometimes it's not just physical, it's not just financial, but sometimes it's mental. You know, there's some people who sometimes get into a, a, a moment where they just can't get out of that negativity that's in their mind. Uh, maybe you suffer through depression, anxiety, and just thinking about your anxiety makes you more anxious. And you, and, you, and you tend to struggle and you tend to, to want something to change. And so maybe you go see a therapist, which is healthy. Yes, I agree. You should, you should go see somebody, talk to people about your problems and things like that. And there's something about transformation that we all just desire to be transformed. But I want to talk to you today about a bigger need than all of those other things. A bigger need than your physical health, a bigger need than your financial health, and a bigger need than your mental health. And that is about your spiritual health. You see, when we see Jesus in this, uh, in this moment, yes, he does a physical transformation. But I want to point you to the transformative power that Jesus has over your life, not just in your health, not just in your physical, not just in your financial, not just in your mental, but more importantly, in your spiritual life. And so today, I really want us to focus this on this idea of Jesus' transformative power. See, Jesus demonstrates his divine authority and power through transforming ordinary situations into extraordinary displays of grace and abundance. And the big idea, the big thing that I want us to leave today with is this. Write it down if you can. Christ's transformative power can bring grace in abundance to every aspect of our lives. Christ's transformative power can bring grace and abundance to every aspect of our lives. How does he do that? Well, he does it at a wedding. The wedding is the setting of our story this morning. We see here in verse 1 that on the third day, completing that first week of ministry, and if you've been paying attention to the days as we've been reading it from John chapter 1 all the way to John chapter 2, this is the first seven days of his ministry, first six, seven days of his ministry, which as we're reminded in the beginning of the book, where it begins, in the beginning was the word, it's this recreation of creation. We see how Jesus is in creation. John is a very strategic writer, and so he's giving you this first week 
of Jesus' ministry. And he's showing how this first impactful sign is an important one to his ministry. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Cana of Galilee is situated there in the, in the Sea of Galilee, very close to where he was at. It's actually where one of the disciples that we learned about last time who started following Jesus was from. And there was something, there was a situation here that uh, kind of messed up the wedding. It says this. It says, and the mother of Jesus was there, so his mom was invited, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now, obviously, this probably was a close family member, probably somebody close to Jesus, somebody they knew, somebody who they had ties with. And if you get invited to a wedding, you go to a wedding, right? I mean, weddings are fun. Now, if you think weddings are fun today, you should know how these people celebrated, all right? Because weddings were just on another level, all right? Weddings in these days could last up to seven days, all right? Imagine that. I'm actually invited to a wedding. My, my wife's cousin is getting married in May. And we're and this is kind of like a, a, a big wedding. Why? Because it's not just one day. We got we to gotta drive all the way up to, uh, what is it, St. Petersburg? St. Augustine. I always get those mixed up. St. Augustine, right? And they're getting married in a bank vault. It's crazy. It's awesome. And so, but we got to drive up there, right? And so it's on a Saturday, but we got to drive up on a Friday. And so on Friday, we have a pre-party, right? There's a pre-party to the wedding. On Saturday is the actual wedding. And then on Sunday is like a beach day, like party after. So it's like one of those big weddings. Now, here's what I'll tell you. If you thought a one-day wedding was expensive, Imagine what a seven-day-long wedding would have been, right? Like mortgage of the house, like having to spend everything. Those of you guys who are planning your wedding, you can imagine, or those of you who have planned weddings, you know how expensive things are. Imagine having to provide for the guests and all of these different things, accommodations and all of these different things. And all of this, right, contrary to our popular and how we do things, was the responsibility of the groom. Not the wives' parents, all right? And so that's a little different than how, than how we do it today. But in those days, in that culture, it was the responsibility of the groom to provide all of the resources and all of the things for the wedding. But there was a problem here at this wedding. What was the problem? Ooh, there was no booze. Let's find out. Let's see here. It says this in verse 3. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, to you and me, it's just kind of like, okay, we'll go to the grocery store, go buy some more stuff, go to the liquor store, and go buy some more stuff, and we'll provide for the wedding. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of people at this wedding. There's a lot of wine that was needed. And not only to you and to me would have been like, okay, well, get in, like, whatever. If we, we don't just don't have wine. It's fine, right? But in those days... They, you got to remember that that culture is a very shame and honor culture, right? You guys are, are familiar with these kind of cultures. We, we live more of an, an independent. We don't really focus on shame and honor. But this culture is a very Eastern culture who believed a lot in honor and shame. Think of like Asian cultures today who they believe like, oh, a, uh, honor and shame and actions and, you're, and you don't disrespect and all of these different things. And so in this moment, this would have been one of the most shameful things to ever happen to these people. Like, this would be the talk of the town, how they had a wedding and they were not able to provide enough wine. This is something crucial in this place. This is something that, that would completely change and the, the trajectory of that family. Nobody would invite them anymore to weddings. It would be a disgrace. And so this is a moment that was very impactful for them. And so Mary, at some point, maybe she had some sort of connection. It's been said that maybe she was in charge of helping to plan the wedding or something like that. <clears throat> By the way, I'm still a little recovering from sickness, so if I cough, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> but, uh, and so Mary here has some sort of intervention. And the first thing that we see here is Jesus' transformative power not only starts transforming the water into the wine, but we see here that Jesus transforms shame into honor. That's point number one, if you want to write that down. Jesus transforms shame into honor. As we see, this is a very dishonoring moment. 
for this person. He comes, and we don't actually know if it's him, but his mom comes and asks Jesus. She says this, they have no wine. Verse 4, and Jesus said to her, what business do you have with me, woman? Now, that sounds a little disrespectful to you and me, especially talking to your mom. Like, you might have gotten slapped if you said that to your mom. But this is not the way Jesus intended it, all right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distancing word, yes, but it's not a disrespectful. And we'll talk about the reasons why it was distancing in a second here. Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. And it says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. She anticipated that Jesus would do something. And so we see here that, that uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, brings a request that somebody was going to be shamed to Jesus. Now, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I was trying to remember of a time where something like this has happened to me. Uh, when I was little, I, uh, it was hard to come by money. I don't know if you guys have ever, when you're little, like you thought $20 was like, I'm so rich. Like, I have so much money. Now, this was a, a time uh, when there was no credit cards, right? Like, I, I don't know if you, you're, like, the thought of going to the store with cash to you seems, like, weird. Like, you, don't, you just go to the, the store with, with cards, right, and you just swipe, whatever. But this is a time where you would have to have cash because the only other way of paying was with a check, right? And my parents did that all the time. You go to, go to the store and pay with a check. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but okay, pay now. Like, it's embarrassing to take out your checkbook and, like, $5.67 for, like, up for your, like, it's, it's just embarrassing, right? And so I remember I had $20, and I said to my family, you know what? I'm tired of eating this house food that we always have. You know what? I'm going to order pizza. You know what? I have $20. I can pay for it myself. Hey, okay. And so we called, and my mom's like, okay, fine. I mean, you got pizza money. You just spend your pizza money. I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy no pizza. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I'll, tr- my treat for everybody in the house. We'll buy this pizza. And so I called, we called, we ordered. And the guy shows up to my house. And when I get to the door, I go to my wallet. And there's no $20 in there. Now, there's something that you don't know about me. This is probably something you will learn. I tend to lose things a lot. All right? I'm a very forgetful person. I tend to lose things. And so I had lost the $20. I didn't have it. And I have this guy in front of me with pizzas ready to deliver, and I have no way of paying him. How embarrassing. I felt so ashamed. I f- like, it was that moment where I was thinking to myself, like, I'm a big kid. Like, I'm, I'm a big boy now. Like, I can do things on my own. And it was just so demeaning to me because it just knocked me down like 17 levels that my mom had to go to a place where my dad had some cash stashed and she went and got the money and she paid for the pizza so that I wouldn't be embarrassed. But let me tell you, that stuck with me. Not having pizza money that day, oh my goodness. Anyways, it's a very shameful thing to not be able to pay what you say you're going to do. And if you are hosting a wedding, you should be able to provide enough wine, enough drinks for the people. And so this person would have been very shamed. Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus doesn't say, well, that's your problem, man. That's kind of your thing. Jesus doesn't say like, oh, well, I mean, shame is not really as important as all of these other things. But what Jesus does is he intervenes in the situation. Jesus goes and he transforms the water into the wine. See, sometimes we might think think to ourselves, my situation is kind of shameful. My situation, maybe not shameful in the way of like, um, in in a bad way, but maybe you think to yourself, everybody else around me is in a relationship. Everybody is just further ahead than I'm at. And I'm kind of embarrassed that I'm not at the same place that everybody else is at. Maybe you think to yourself, man, I'm pretty old already. And I'm not at that place financially where I should be. I look at everybody else around me and I think to myself, man, look at everybody else's houses and cars and, and things like that. And, and like you feel a little bit of shame. You feel a little bit of, of, of man, I, I wish I was there. And then you tend to think to yourself, but man, I just, I just got to deal with it on my own. 
I just got to deal and swallow, you know, swallow the shame and just kind of deal with it on my own. When here's what we see from this passage, you could bring all of that to God. As a matter of fact, you should bring all of that to God. There's moments in our lives where we are feeling like this is too insignificant, too mundane, too maybe personal or prideful to bring it to Jesus. Listen, this is what we should do with these things. We should bring all of our needs to God. We are able to bring it to Him because He is our Father. Now, here's what's interesting about this passage. We can bring all of these things to Jesus because Jesus takes our shame and He actually places it upon Himself. See, there's a a big need that we have beyond just the physical. Yes, he can take care of your financial needs. Yes, he could take care of maybe the shame is like, I'm overweight, or maybe the shame is like, I'm in financial debt. Maybe the shame is in all of those things that we talked about before. But here's the thing. God can take that shame and turn it into honor. How does he do that? Well, in the greatest way imaginable. See, you and I were in guilt and shame. How? Well, because of our sin. Our sin and our, sh- and, our, and, our, and our sin and our trespasses put this guilt and this shame on us. I don't know if you've ever been ashamed of your sinful life. I don't know if you've ever thought of who you are privately in your own mind and thought to yourself, man, I am so guilty. I'm so ashamed. I don't even want to show up to church today. Maybe you're watching online today because you're too ashamed to show your face here in church. Maybe there's something going on in your life that you don't want to share with anybody because there's this sin, there's this shame inside of you. But here's the thing about Jesus. He actually takes your shame and he places it upon himself. What do I mean by that? Well, because of his sacrifice on the cross, he actually is shamed for us. He takes our shame He takes our guilt. He takes our sin. The sin that came to your mind as I was talking to you about this, the things that you're thinking about, the guilt and all of that stuff, he takes it upon himself and he nails it on the cross. And he dies on that cross naked, shameful, taking the brunt of all of our sin and shame, and he dies for us. And in turn, he replaces our shame that we once had with now glory and honor. When God the Father looks at us, he doesn't see us as this shameful creature who is just so full of sin. What he sees in us is the righteousness of Christ. It's called the great exchange. How Jesus transforms our guilt, our shame, and he turns it into honor. And it is through the process of he himself becoming sin. The Bible reminds us that he himself bore our sins for us on his body on that cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It says God has made him who knew no sin, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, Jesus not only transforms water into wine, he takes our biggest shame, he takes our biggest guilt, and he transforms it into honor, and he transforms it into glory. Jesus has the power of transformation. We not only see that he has this power of transformation, and, you know, this this act that that he separates himself from his mom actually is for a reason. See, she doesn't come to him as his mom. She comes to him as any of us would. This is why he distanced himself from her. See, there's a misapplication in this passage as well. Some people will look at this passage and will say, you see, you need to go through Mary to get to Jesus. Because if you go, do you see in this passage that Mary has to come to Jesus, and in order for us to get to Jesus, you got to go through Mary. That's a misapplication of this passage. Actually, what you see here is the exact opposite. Mary tries to come to him as a relative, as his mom. You're not going to say no to your mom, right? But no, Jesus says, Hold on. My hour has not yet come. What does that mean? What does it mean that his hour has not yet come? Well, we actually find out later that when Jesus says his hour, he's talking about his death. He's talking about his resurrection. He's talking about his glorification. In other words, the time to pray to me to do things for you has not yet come. 
And it doesn't come through the means of a personal relation, meaning you can't be born into this relationship, but it is an adoption into this relationship. And so the same way that, Jesus, that, that Mary can come to Jesus and asking him for her to remove the guilt of this person, the same way you and I can come to Jesus. Not because of our personal family ties, but because of our relationship with Jesus. He is in honor, he is in glory, and we can come to him with whatever we need, in our, in, even in our times of guilt and shame. The second thing that we see here is not only... Can we, can, does Jesus transform shame into honor? But we also see that Jesus transforms rituals into redemption. He transforms rituals into redemption. You know, as I was reading this passage, as I said, it was a familiar passage to me. I, I, I know it well. But as I was reading this and I was focusing here in verse uh, 6, something stood out to me. And when something stands out to you, you always want to ask yourself, why? Why is that important? Why is this here? Why is this detail in this passage? Look at what it says here in verse 6. It says, Now there were six stone water pots standing there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing two or three measures each. And so I knew that Jesus had turned water into wine, but I hadn't realized which water he had turned into wine. I don't know if you know the, the significance of this, But the water purification, the Jews had this ritual of water purification. You see it in different passages where Jesus doesn't, Jesus and his disciples don't wash their hands. And everybody's like, ew, gross. You you didn't wash your hands before you ate. Why don't you do that? And Jesus is like, hey, listen, it's not about the water and the it's not like a bacteria thing, right? It's not like a sanitizing thing. It's a it's a ritual that they had. See, this is what the Jews had done. They had taken the things that God had given them and they had made it into a law. They had said, now if you don't wash your hands before you eat or purify yourself, it is against the law, which was not the original law. It was just something that was added on to the law. And so they thought that through this process of purification, they would wash themselves clean. And so everybody did it. It was a ritual that they did. It wasn't a bacteria thing. It wasn't like, oh, let's let's get some Germex and some soap and water. Like, no, it was just... Pouring some water, it's just kind of like a, like a little show, right? Oh, we're going to wash, and we wash our hands, right? And so that's what this was for. And what's interesting is that they had more water purification than they had wine, right? And so this was really important. Maybe this was somebody who was focused and who really wanted for people to focus on purification. And so what happens is they run out of wine. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. Now, here's what's interesting about this idea of the purification water and how Jesus uses this vessel to turn it into something that was celebratory. You're not going to see this in, in other passages, but John is very specific And he is a very good writer. And so here's what I want you to realize, because we're going to keep going through the book of John, and you're going to see layers of meaning. What do I mean by that? Well, in the beginning, you're going to see a surface level, right? What's the surface level point of this passage? We see that in verse uh, 11. It says, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. What's the point of this miracle? The point is to show off his power so that people can believe in him. As a matter of fact, at the end of the book, in John chapter 20, we see that the reason that all of these signs are written is so that you may believe that Jesus is Lord, right? And so that's the basic surface level of this passage. But there's always layers of meaning, layers of meaning. What do I mean by that? Well, as you look at the surface level, let's go one layer below that. As you look at the meaning of how Jesus responds to his mom, he always takes it into a spiritual direction. People look at the physical, and he turns it into the spiritual. In a few weeks, we're going to be talking about the woman at the well, right? Jesus is asking her, like, hey, can you give me some water? She's like, you don't have a bucket, Jesus. How are you going to get water? And Jesus is like, I'm the living water. And so he takes, like, he's talking about physical, and then he takes it spiritual, 
right? We, we're going to talk next week about the temple. And he's talking about the temple, the physical temple, but Jesus is like, I'm the temple. Like, like he's always up, one-upping and spiritualizing everything. And he does the same thing here. He says, hey, turn the, we need help. And Jesus is like, oh, wait, my time has not yet come. Time for you to request things for me hasn't yet come. And so the level here that we see is that Jesus is transforming these old rituals, these old ways of purification and cleanliness into this new age of celebration. He's turning what once purified through physical means, the rituals and the patterns that people did to try to cleanse themselves through these mundane ways, he turns it into a way of actually being cleansed. See, he turns this water into wine. This wine represents many things. First thing that comes to your mind when you think of wine, you think of what? Party. Yeah. Having fun. All right. We're not going to get into the, into the intricacies about whether Christians should drink wine or not and things like that. Listen, that's a discussion for a whole nother time. But we see Jesus enjoying wine. So I think you know where I'm going with this, right? Just don't get drunk. And so we see that, that Jesus here is transforming it into a celebration. He's rejoicing. He's celebrating. He's having, like, what is he celebrating? He's celebrating that you no longer have to toil and work for your purification anymore. The new wine is here. The good wine is here. It's here in abundance. Rejoice that Jesus Christ has come to actually purify us from everything. But there's a second meaning to this wine. Why? Because later on in the, in the, in the book of John, wine takes on the meaning of the blood of Jesus. See, as we participate in the Lord's Supper, as we did last week, and as we remember his sacrifice, Jesus tells the people, this wine is now my blood that has been given for you. This wine would represent this purification that we now have, this cleanliness that we have, this uh, this idea that we no longer have to be... uh, and we have to be purified by what we do, by these rituals, by these things that we have to, uh, uh, to, to practice. But now we are being purified simply by the blood and the sacrifice of God. I don't know how many of you guys need to hear this this morning, but coming to church will not get you closer to God. Forcing yourself to read your Bible will not get you closer to God. Working your way towards paying Jesus back for his sacrifice will not get you closer to God. The only thing that draws you close to God is the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for you. All of those other things, you get to do. All of those other things, going to church, reading your Bible, doing all of these things, hey, these are not for your, pur- your, for your purification. They're because of your purification. You are now able to rejoice. You're able to learn more about God. See, I don't know how many of you guys are thinking about what you have to do to merit and and, and earn God's favor, but here's what I'll tell you. You can do nothing to merit or earn God's favor. It is already given to you as a free gift from God. We can celebrate. We can rejoice. We can uh, can have a party and, 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 and just enjoy because God has already done everything required for our salvation. The blood of Jesus is all we need. The sacrifice that he has given to us is all we need for salvation. And so let's rejoice. Let's not toil and work hard for our salvation. Let's work hard because of our salvation. Jesus takes these mundane, these practices and these rituals into now this new way of living, this new life in him. Not only does he transform our shame into honor. Not only does he transform our rituals into redemption, but point number three, he transformed the mundane into the miraculous. Now we get to the uh, climax of this story here. Jesus has told the people, let's turn this water into wine. But what's interesting is that it's a secret. He's like, shh, don't tell anybody. Just take it to that guy. See what he says. Like, I imagine Jesus and his disciples kind of like, what's he going to say? Oh, is he going to try it? Oh, he tried it. He tried it. What? And the guy's, like, face must have been like, what is this? What kind of wine is this? Why would you save this to the end? Look at what it says here. It says in verse uh, verse 9, it says, and they took it to him. Now when the head waiter tasted the wine 
tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from. But here's the little secret part. It says, but the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. It says, the head waiter called the groom, the guy who was responsible to provide the wine, the guy who would have been shamed for not having enough wine. He says, hey, you, get over here. Stop crying in the corner. Get over here. Where did this wine come from? This is some good wine. Not only that, this is like the best wine you have. Crazy. He said to him, every man serves a good wine first. With the guest, when the guests are drunk, then he serves the poor wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. What's wrong with you, man? Why aren't you following the customs and the, ways that, the way that we do the uh, things? It, 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 it could, it, he couldn't comprehend that they would save the best wine for last. And what's hilarious about this is that we never see that the groom says anything about it. He's like, yeah, I meant to do that. That was all part of my plan. Yeah. He get, listen, does Jesus get recognized for this? No. Nobody at the wedding knows that Jesus did this. He turns this guy's shame into honor. He's like, oh, this guy, like, he provided not only abundant wine, but the best wine. But this is the best party we've ever been to. We love it. And the guy is the one who has the honor. But Jesus knows what he did. Jesus knows what happened. His disciples know what happened. The waiters know what happened. What's interesting here is that he turns in the mundane, the simple water into something miraculous. I don't know if you've ever tried to turn water into wine, but it's a very difficult process. Uh, you know, they don't sell like little Kool-Aid packs of, of wine that you could just kind of add to your water, maybe a couple little spices, some ketchup, and maybe some grape juice, and we'll turn it into wine. I don't know if you know the process of making wine, uh, but it's a very long, it's a very difficult process. I've actually been looking up uh, some, uh, some fermentation processes and things like that. I was talking to CJ, uh, we we're, were talking about like that process of like, how does that water turn into wine? Let me tell you. It's a very complicated process. Now, just think about from a, from a chemical perspective, right? There's specific starting materials, which is not water. They're grapes, right? Which have to be planted and harvested at a specific time. These grapes then are squished and, and processed, and their juice is taken. But you, that, that doesn't give you any wine. That just gives you grape juice. It's not going to help you. This is the best wine. And so these grapes now have to be processed. So now you have to add some biological agents, such as yeast, and specific kinds of yeast to actually uh, ferment and, and turn that. And now, not only that, you have to have the right temperature. You have to have the right acidity. You have the right, to have the right oxygen levels. And you have to have enough time. It's estimated that a wine of this quality would have taken months to years to produce. And Jesus does it like that. Sometimes our familiarity with this passage makes us forget how powerful of a miracle this is. Like, this is beyond a party trick. Like, this is a miracle that nobody else could ever replicate. And Jesus does it instantly. He demonstrates, he shows off his transformative power. He's not held back by time. He's not held back by chemistry. He's not held back by physics. He is able to do the miracle instantaneously. Now, let me ask you a question. If Jesus has the power to transform things that are scientifically impossible to do, how much more can he do in your life? If he can transform the mundane into the miraculous how can much more can he transform our meaningless lives into a meaningful relationship with him? See, the transformative power of Jesus doesn't just stop at the physical. The transformative power of Jesus applies to our lives as well. We can be transformed by the power of Jesus. Yes, this miracle demonstrates who Jesus is, God in the flesh, God himself, a miracle worker. He proves to his disciples who he is, and they believe in him. The question is, do you believe in him? Do you believe in his transformative power? See, we all face this problem of sin and inadequacy. We fall short 
of all the standards of God. And we think we are too far away from him to be saved. And yet, he can transform your mundane life into something glorious, into something miraculous. See, God wants us to understand that just as Jesus transformed water into wine, he has the power to transform our lives into a right relationship with God, turning us from enemies of God to children of God, turning us from the wrath of God to the favor of God. The transformative power of Jesus does not limit himself to the physical. It is in the eternal as well. He wants us to remember that as he intervenes in our lives, he cares for us. He cares for the little details in your life. He cares about when you are shameful. He cares about those details in your life where you think he may not care about you, but he cares as a father should. He wants to intervene in our lives, and he wants to, us to have this great relationship with him. The gospel is the power of God that transforms us. The Bible reminds us in Romans 12.1 that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. See, the transformative power of Jesus doesn't just stop when we are saved. Because that's a big part of it, right? Salvation is a huge part of transformation. But it is also a process of sanctification. He transforms our evil thoughts into his thoughts. He transforms our evil deeds into good deeds. He transforms our evil practices into good practices. He transforms us and makes us and conforms us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We are not only transformed in salvation, but we are transformed in sanctification. Maybe this morning, you need that transformative power of Jesus. Maybe this morning, you've kind of felt to yourself, it's time for a change. Maybe you've looked at yourself in the mirror and uh, not only noticed uh, the love handles and the the extra weight, but you've also noticed your need for God this morning. I invite you to join Jesus Christ because he has the power to transform each and every one of your lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you that even at a wedding, you show how great you are. Lord, I pray for those in this room today, maybe watching us online, who have not experienced that transformative power, who have never experienced what it means to go from being dead in our sins to being alive in Christ, from being in guilt and shame because of our sins to standing with the righteousness of Christ because of your sacrifice. God, I pray that today might be the day of that, their salvation that today might be a day where you are transforming, doing the greatest miracle, more, uh, even greater than turning water into wine, turning a sinner into a saint. God, that is a true miracle. Miracles that happen each and every day, and we pray that you would have that miracle happen today. May you transform somebody who is a son of darkness into a son of light, a daughter of darkness into a daughter of light. Lord, we ask you that you would impact the hearts and the minds of people. God, we also pray for those who are already transformed, who have experienced that that transformation from death to life, who have experienced that transformation from sin and guilt into honor and glory, but Lord, who may be still stuck in their sins. Lord, as your word says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God, we ask for freedom this morning. We ask for freedom from sin from thinking in a a wrong way about this world and about themselves, Lord. May you transform their mind so they think like you, so that they have the mind of Christ, so that they're conformed into the image of your Son. God, I ask you that today might be the day where they look at themselves in light of your word, as James uh, says, as we look not in a mirror dimly, but as we look at the Word of God, we see what needs to be changed. May we look at that mirror of our lives and recognize that something has to change. And know that you are the only one who has the transformative power to change us. 
God, we pray for that transformation in our spiritual life. God, help us to be more like you. God, turn our deeds of our flesh into fruit of the Spirit. God, help us to walk each and every day serving you, following you, living for you, and having a unique relationship with the only one who has a transformative power, Jesus Christ. It's in his name, in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more worship song, and then I'm going to just give you a couple of uh, exiting remarks.